Hi, I'm Steve. I'm Matt. Uh, we're gonna stand behind the podium to obscure the fact that we are, at times in this presentation, reading. Um, and I'm gonna start with a semi-dramatic reading of um, an excerpt from uh, a fairly well-written story by New York Times reporter John Branch, just to show you what we're up against. Beyond the lights glowing from the ski area, snow still fell over the ridge, too, in the vast darkness of steep meadows and narrow gullies just past the western edge of Stevens Pass. Each snowflake added to the depth, and each snowflake added to the weight. It might take a million snowflakes for a skier to notice the difference. It might take just one for a mountain to move. So you can't fight that kind of writing with uh, hairballs or bar charts. Um, and I don't think Mike Bostock would, be, would mind our inclusion of one of his early drafts since he made his completed graphic was much clearer than this. Um, but as an example of a, a hairball, since this is what uh, a lot of people think of when you say data visualization. Um, and when I say fight, I mean come alongside or sit next to or be compared with or live up to. And that's what we aspire to uh, in the New York Times graphics department. We're, we're visual journalists. Um, we exist within a sea of carefully reported and uh, carefully calibrated, sometimes beautifully, beautifully written words. Uh, so our visual story is better measure up. So what, what do we do? So we make the maps, charts, diagrams, uh, both to the printed newspaper, uh, but also interactive versions for nytimes.com. Is there anything, let's say, like a story we published this summer where it's an interactive graphic, an interactive map? that it let you see what are the chances that a kid who grew up in the bottom of the income class across the country would move up into the top. For here, we built an explanation of Rafael Nadal's knee injury around a 3D model, uh, like uh, x-ray-like image of his knee, a uh, model that we built, uh, built by one of our 3D artists, Graham Roberts. Here we show readers what's changed in New York under Mayor Bloomberg by flying them around a 3D model made of building height data. I'm just going to let this play for a minute. We included some before and after photographs. And here, uh, as we slide down the page, we integrate motion graphics and other kinds of multimedia with a written article. And eventually, we fly you over the Cascade Mountain Range, which is really a 3D model of elevation data that was created by Jeremy White. So this is our um, occasionally taken class photo. Yep. And, and there, there we are. are. Uh, and so one, th one thing that's interesting about the department um, is that really there's probably only two or three people in the department that have formal training as designers. Um, it's a very eclectic mix, which is great for when you're actually like trying to cover news stories. Um, we have uh, a statistician. We have, uh, we have cartographers. We have web developers. We have uh, people who just specialize in interactive maps. We have uh, designers. We have journalists. We have a former competitive figure skater. Uh, and a former uh, Chinese translator turned uh, interactive map maker. Um, and so one thing that uh, this means is like we work in the middle of the newsroom. So any story we do uh, requires us. We're visual journalists. Like we're working with journalists. And so it may require something like scraping data and analyzing a large data set to produce a graphic. Or something more traditional like on the ground reporting. So here's an example. This photo shows quite a large uh, group of law enforcement types in Watertown, Massachusetts. And they are looking for the suspect behind the Boston Marathon bombings. But there's a guy riding uh, his bike in the foreground. And that's Tim. Tim Wallace is a cartographer in our department. And we sent him to Boston to report on the, to report on the story. And just as a quick aside, here's Archie Say, another member of the graphics department who uh, here he is in, in, actually in Saddam Hussein's uh, spider hole in 2003. It's not unusual for the graphics team to dispatch uh, members of the desk uh, to do reporting from the field. Here's Tim's work again uh, some, as part of a collaboration with other graphics editors back 
uh, in New York, something that we were developing in real time and, and wouldn't have been able to do if it weren't for Tim in Boston verifying some of the things uh, on the ground. So how do, how do we use design uh, in the graphics department? Um, and I think ultimately uh, one thing that's really important for us that we need to keep in mind is that ultimately we're using data and design to tell stories. And especially uh, when it comes to projects that are a bit more data focused, very data visualization, vi visualization heavy, like that's something we always want to think about is like what is the story we're trying to tell and what's the best way to let people do that? Uh, this is some data we got uh, a few years ago uh, showing every pitch that uh, the coordinates of every pitch that Yankees pitcher Mariano Rivera, who's a phenomenal pitcher, threw over the course of the season. It gives you the uh, coordinates in like a 3D space. And we thought like immediately saw this a lot. This is great. We can use this to like show, like show all of his pitches and show why Mariano Rivera is so good. Um, and so started off, we took the, took the data, brought it into a 3D program, thought, look at that. We got them all plotted out. We figured out how to work with the data. Um, like you can, we could let people filter it, see like what did he do on three two counts or what did he, what did he do against what pitches did he throw to righties and lefties? Like we went as far as even like here's an illustrator mock-up of an interface we thought like we'll build this, like put it up online and readers will be fascinated by it. But it turns out that like when you actually just, like stop to think about this, like unless you're a major league pitching coach, you can't make heads or tails <laughs> of that. Like I have no idea what it means for the pitches to be spread around the home plate like that, which like is that a good percentage in the strike zone or a bad percentage in the strike zone? So one of the great things about having a department um, that, like where we view ourselves as journalists is that that's what we want to do. It's like we can call up sources, say, all right, we've got this data. Like can you, how can we use it to explain why Mariano Rivera is so good? Um, so we changed focus a little bit. We thought, all right, let's, let's move away from the data visualization. Let's move and turn into some sort of narrative piece that uses this data to actually tell a story. So we sort of, uh, after we did some reporting about like what we could tell from the data uh, and what we, why Mariano Rivera, like what were the keys to success for, we sketched out a storyboard. I'm just going to show a little clip of the piece that resulted uh, that uh, was based on this. Hitters often rely on reading a pitch's spin to determine what pitch is coming. But Rivera's fastball and cutter have what appear to the hitter as the same spin. Many pitchers throw their cutters more like sliders, with their fingers pulling down on the side of the ball. This can create more downward and lateral movement than a cutter, but it also creates the signature spin of a slider, a spinning red dot, that the hitter can recognize and adjust to. With identical deliveries and spins on Rivera's pitches, hitters are at a loss to identify and then attack the pitch until it is too late and the balls end up in very different locations. Here are the nearly 1,300 pitches that Rivera threw in 2009, each frozen at the point when the batter must make his swing decisions. But with few clues to determine the pitch's ultimate location, the batter can be faced with guessing at these outcomes. Here are the cutters to left-handers. Here are the cutters to right-handers. And fastballs to right-handers. He throws almost no fastballs to lefties. As this map of his 2009 pitches shows, Rivera is remarkably adept at hitting the corners, keeping the ball away from the middle of the plate, the easiest spot for a batter to make good contact. Looking from this perspective, it's not surprising that the real hot spot is inside on a lefty. I think he could hit that spot with his eyes closed. Rivera's simple but effective formula has made him baseball's most dominant closer. <laughs> uh, so, so in that case, I think it's like pretty clear that like that's exactly the same data we were looking at in the first thing. But like combining like combining it with the reporting, combining it with the design, the narrative like helps just like make that understandable and tell a story. What else do we try and do? We also try and use design to like take complex things, say like the electoral, all the possible electoral college scenarios coming up, leading up to a presidential election, mm -hmm. and like make them clear to readers. So every, like, every uh, year before presidential election, like, one of the things that's like, always a question is like, how are the states going to vote? Like, who's, who's the lead or not? What are the routes to victory for either Obama or Romney? Um, and there's some states uh, every year that's a pretty safe bet. It's a pretty safe bet that California is going to go Democratic. It's a pretty safe bet that uh, Wyoming is going to go Republican. So often the election is riding in about six to 12 swing states. Um, but even if you look at all the different combinations of the way that those states could vote, that means that there's like somewhere between 64 and 4,000 different outcomes just in those small set of states. So over the years, we've tried to say like, are there tools we can develop? Are there ways we can sort of clearly show like what the paths to victory for both candidates are? Like who's more likely 
to win, what states are sort of the keys to victory. We've made some attempts at this. This is one of our first ones back in 2004. Um, and these are things where it's like, you know, we want to build an electoral vote calculator, an electoral vote map. You could go in, you could like, you'd show the states that were uh, leaning one way or the other and the ones that were up for grabs. And you could click on them and fill in your electoral map and see how things would uh, go. Uh, but one of the things that, like, as we built variations of this is like, it bothered Sean Carter, uh, one of our uh, graphics editors, that it was always like, it felt like we weren't really using the tool, like design tools to sort of like make clear like what the uh, sort of paths to victory were. Like you're still forcing people to do a lot of interaction. You had to go through and you actually had to like, you had to try like dozens of different scenarios. What happened if like Florida went over to the Democratic side? Um, so uh, coming to the election this fall, he thought like maybe there's a better way we can design something that sort of just clearly shows uh, the, uh, the routes to victory. So we're inspired by a few graphics that both we had done before and also this is one uh, that's uh, inspired us that uh, Newsweek magazine had done back in 2008. There was just a sort of a simple decision tree like based on cl poll closing times, what you could guess from like how states went. Um, and so we thought like maybe there's some way to just like, we want to build an electoral vote calculator. That maybe it doesn't have electoral votes. Maybe it doesn't have a calculator. Maybe it just shows the paths to victory and how many there are for each candidate. So this is the first sketch. This is basically they like shows five, there's nine states up for grabs, which means that there's uh, 512 different ways, combinations of the ways states could vote. We, and Sean started saying, all right, here's just like a form of like working your way down through all the options. Like now how can we use design to sort of make this clear? So I just get play through, uh, we have uh, screenshots of all of Sean's revision as he went through and like, all right, how can we clear this? How can we use design to clean this up? How can we make it clear? We can add some icons, we can style it. Uh, we're about 100 revisions in right now. It's starting to take a little bit more shape. We had a brief uh, appearance of Obama and icons. And then we add, add some annotations. And what results is actually, I think, just a very clear presentation of, that lets you just go in and see, Obama has 430 uh, combinations to win. Romney has 76. You sort of see that uphill battle. And if Obama wins Florida, that means that Romney would have to win every other state. So any other state that uh, Obama took would put him over the top. Whereas meanwhile, if Romney wins Florida and Ohio, then it starts to even up more. And it just like this interaction, this simple design sort of gives you, takes this sort of complex set of scenarios and builds it down to like just a simple presentation. So enable the impossible. What, what this really means is um, putting readers in slightly unfamiliar uh, scenarios as a, a way of creating a compelling story. And I'm going to show you a part of a, a graphic that was done, or a motion graphic that was done by Kevin Qualey and, and Graham Roberts to cover the uh, London uh, 2012 Olympics. Just how fast was Usain Bolt's gold medal sprint? Let's put him on a slightly bigger stage and see him race against every Olympic medalist since 1896. This imaginary race, assembled using runners' average speeds, reveals just how much faster sprinters have become. A few lanes over, we see another Usain Bolt, who dominated the field in Beijing in 2008. <coughs> Almost 10 feet back, Carl Lewis, gold medalist in Seoul in 1988. He won in 1984, too, one of just a handful of sprinters on this track twice. As we go further back in time, we pass more of the fastest sprinters in history. Jim Hines, the first man to break 10 seconds in the Olympics. Jesse Owens, who won four golds in Berlin in 1936. Archie Hahn, the Milwaukee Meteor, who won three events in 1904. And finally, near the end of this track, we have Tom Burke, who won in Athens in 1896. His time, 12 seconds, puts him more than 60 feet behind today's winner. I think you get the idea. Um. I think you get the idea. Uh, and looking back at the graphic that Matt was going through, the 512 paths to the White House, um, you know, it's a complex data set, even, even an intimidating data set. And, and this is the opposite. You can find pretty much all the data that you need to make this graphic just by Googling Wikipedia Olympics 100 meters. So that's where Kevin started. And he created some simple sketches just uh, based on average speeds and using the 2008 data. And as we started to think about the form that it might take, uh, we remembered that you know, we'd actually done this thing um, back in, in 2008 in a simple chart. It's just a print graphic that we did uh, about a week after the Olympics. 
Um, and it conveys some of the same information, but uh, it wasn't enough. You know, it's, it's almost like a bar chart. And Kevin likes to say, well, almost every graphic that we do could be a bar chart, but we don't want to make bar charts all the time. So we started to talk about how we kind of crack the, the data set open to annotate it, to, to show you some of the familiar names like Carl Lewis, give you highlights like Jesse Owens, to make comparisons like comparing a 1980 silver medalist time to 15 and 16 year olds today and just uh, really reveal how fast the runners are going now. And you know, the other part of this I think that is effective is that we've taken a simple chart and created a scene that doesn't exist in reality. It's memorable because we've taken readers what, where they, they haven't been before. Uh, but one thing that's, uh, that's important to emphasize is like the goal of our department is not like merely to create memorable visualizations or memorable graphics. Like the goal of our department is to really like clearly explain like the news and what's happening in the world to readers. Like that's what we view our like primary mission as. Um, and so that like on a day when uh, there's news that's breaking, that can mean that we're shifting gears. Um, and all of a sudden, like on say March 11th, 2011. Uh, we thought it was going to be a normal day in the graphics department until there was a gigantic tsunami uh, that occurred uh, just off the coast of Japan. And all of a sudden, like, within the course of hours, we had gone from like, not ever having any idea that this would be something we'd need to be reporting on and building uh, visualizations and graphics around to having probably 10 or 15 people uh, launched on the story on various aspects of it from reporting, like finding who are the sources, like who are the tsunami experts that we need to talk to to like find out what's going on, like who has data showing the wave heights of the tsunami across the Pacific and when, when they'll arrive, what's going on in Japan, what's happening on the ground, like what were the effects there, uh, what's happening inside the nuclear reactors. We like needed to like report out the data like to figure out like what type of nuclear reactors were at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant like and also get some of the 3D artists we have like working and building like accurate models of them. Um, and so as part of that reporting process, like we're talking to a lot of sources. Um, and one of the things that we're doing is like we're really looking for the opportunities where uh, graphics can like really explain a story to readers in a way that you can't do through words or photographs alone. So I'm just going to read a sentence here from a front page story that uh, ran a couple days after the tsunami that just says, Entire villages and parts of Japan's northern Pacific coast have vanished under a wall of water, and many communities are cut off, leaving the country trying to absorb the scale of the destruction. So, like, you can write that in a story, but, like, it's, like, really hard in some ways to, like, like get a real picture. Like, what does that mean? Like, how, like, you want to see, like, how bad was the destruction? What was there before? So, uh, we were talking to uh, some people we've worked with at GOI, a satellite imaging company. Um, and they gave us a heads up uh, that where they had had a satellite overhead and got photographs of the coast. Um, and so about one o'clock in the morning, uh, we got the first images in from them that they sent over. Um, and so this is just one of the images. Um, and we started like saying like, all right, how can we take this? Like this is like shows sort of the destruction, but like how can we just like really make clear to readers and design something that lets them sort of just understand and really see this destruction for themselves. So over the course of about five hours, between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m., we like figured out, okay, can we get imagery that showed what these places were like before? Can we build an interface uh, that lets you, a reader just go in and see? Like, it's a very simple interface. It just has a slider in the middle with the before image on the left and before image on the right. But like, it's very powerful because you could just see, like, before there were hundreds of homes there, and afterwards, like, you just see how they were washed away. And I think just seeing that in that way, it's sort of like you understood just the tremendous power of that tsunami and destruction that it wrought in a way that it was, like, hard to get, like, just from reading the story. So we're back to this project. Uh, and I recognize that <clears throat> there's a certain amount of snowfall fatigue in the Times newsroom, but it's, it's worth mentioning this piece again as part of this idea that journalist designers uh, work a little differently. So the idea behind this project was to make a single story out of text and multimedia. You can see on this early sketch that the black horizontal bars represent multi multimedia elements and that there's a column of copy. And the hope was that we would bring it all together into something that was more than the sum of its parts. And it's an extension of graphics thinking that doesn't mm -hmm. treat design just as a vessel for content. The design is editing. The design shapes the content, just like editing. And we can do it even on deadline. So here's an example. This is a story that ran just a few days after a fire in Arizona killed 19 firefighters. 
And we've woven all kinds of elements into the piece, maps, diagrams. Uh, and it was all based on a conversation that we had with the national desk and the national editor about how we were going to structure the story. You know, it was a, it was a collaboration uh, that developed this uh, story. And so we end up with this motion graphic at the end where we show you the town that the fire, fire, firefighters were working to protect. And then we locate where the firefighters were working. And then we swing you around to the point of view of a photographer who was working that day and captured the moment when you know, the winds are sort of shifting in different directions and the fire really expanded rapidly and gives you just this, it puts you at the scene, shows you what the firefighters were facing. So the piece in as a whole, it gives you an, an indication of, of where we're heading. You know, you're sort of reading about that scene, and then you're in that scene. And it's clear that we aren't fighting with the words. We're, we're parallel with them, or even merged into streams of them in ways that make our journalism new. Thanks. Thanks. Sit. Well done. See, I would subscribe just to your work. <laughs> I, I, I subscribe to the New York Times, but, but really, I, I mean, it's, it's like when I see that you've got something in that, I, I get excited like when there's, you know, a big piece of brown sugar on the piece of pie that I got or something. It's, uh, it's that, I'm that much of a geek. Um, so, 30 people work for you, with you. Uh, that's 60,000 person hours a year. How much of that is devoted to long-term projects like Snowfall and how much to breaking news like, oh my God, the, the Boston bombers? Uh, it depends on the year, but uh, in a year when we have three or four you know, major breaking stories, it, it, it's about half and half. Is it? Yeah. And do different people, do, does everybody work sometimes on long-term, sometimes on short-term? Is, is that how the A-team breaks up? It's, it's, I think it's a little mix of like people like will drag people into short term projects and they'll also do long term uh, projects. And one, like one of the things too is like since you're in the newsroom like and you're never quite sure what stories are going on, like you want to have these sort of longer term projects that are going on in the background so right. that like when you have a week or two when it's slow on breaking news like you have something to work on and then... So everyone is employed all the time. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, and have you at this point, now you've been doing it for a while, uh, do you have sort of templates, so, oh, we're doing this thing, now we can pull this off the shelf and just kind of rename it and re plug in new data? Uh, well, I mean, there are two kinds of templates. I mean, there are sort of uh, templates that exist that, that allow us to execute more quickly. So we're just talking about the technology. But there are, you know, there's certainly something to, you know, our experience having done this for 20 years and a lot of people in the department who've been around for a long time and, and respond to a lot of different kinds of events, you have sort of a, a framework in your mind for, you know, at least where to start. You know, all, every story is different, but you have, there are patterns, obviously, in the yeah. news. And so we, you know, I think are able to get off to a faster start just because we've kind of been right. through it before. And have your bosses yet said, hey, you're doing this so much better than anywhere else. Let's start selling this proprietary technology. <laughs> Uh, we've not really had that conversation. <laughs> really? <laughs> they try to keep us focused just on making, covering the okay. news. Okay. Well, they're missing a bet. Um, <laughs> now, this stuff is, a, is awesome to a map-loving statistics geek like me, but I sometimes wonder, I all, sometimes feel as though, oh, you've made this beautiful thing just for me and nobody else will care. Do it, does it make economic sense, rational economic sense for the New York Times to be spending this much time and money on these incredible interactive jewels that maybe only a few people will use? I mean, I, I think you could ask that about the entire news report. I mean, does it make rational <laughs> economic sense to, to have a Baghdad bureau or to send people into Syria? I mean, uh, uh, news gathering is expensive and, you know, we're a part of, you know, the, the newsroom's efforts in total. So. But it's interesting because, of course, the Baghdad bureau thing has been a tradition and a sacred thing that's been built up over decades, century. Whereas this is a new commitment to that kind of, by God, I don't care what it costs, we're going to do it. It is a new yeah. commitment. I mean, I, I think over time, you know, there's been this recognition from the leadership in the newsroom that this is an integral component of our news coverage. 
And, and, and the pieces we do, um, like the most popular pieces we do are like receive about the same number of views as like the most popular stories of the year. So like there is like even there's a metric to say there, there's a metric to yeah. say that like we're we're all in the same ballpark. And this might be difficult for you to answer, but why has the New York Times been able to figure this out so much better and than it has say video? Is it because this is more adjacent to what news reporting, New York Times reporting already was than video is to storytelling? Well, I think there are strong New York Times videos. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I would say about um, you know, information design, information graphics, is there is a pretty long history of it at the Times. You know, if you dig back into the archives, you know, even when we're preparing talks, uh, you find examples of things that are you know, print pieces, but that were as good and rich with information and you know, insightful as things that we're doing now. And, and you know, that when I started you know, 14 years ago, there were people in the department who taught me things. And there, there's this institutional knowledge, I think, that got us off to really a good start. Yeah. In the times, like, even before we were doing stuff online, like, the graphics department there was like, there's a recognition that like, we should be doing visual journalism um, and opening up the space for it in print um, that sort of has carried through to the web. Although now, I'll tell you, when I, when I see uh, you know, your, your, your online interactive cool things, and then I go and see it in the print paper, which I still get every morning, I go, wow, that, that's like, who would want that? <laughs> that's not the right reaction. Uh, I mean, look, there are, I think there are print pieces that are just as stunning as the interactive work. I mean, if there's a double truck piece that, you know, uh, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, I can remember one, a piece that Archie Say made that, you know, revealed for the first time really where the water levels were and how many buildings were affected. And you really just, you're not able to quite scan across that whole scene right. on a monitor. Right, right. No, and like the, just that high resolution of like a piece of paper that's 20 inches wide by 20 inches deep is like, it's hard to beat for some things. Now, did, when John Branch won the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing for Snowfall, did he give you guys credit because he probably wouldn't have won had you not been behind him? Well, I don't, I don't know if he wouldn't have won. I mean, I think it was a beautifully written piece. Sure. Um, uh, but John, I mean, the reason why the piece came together the way it did is because John is a progressive thinker and he is a generous reporter. Like, he came back after, I think, just one reporting trip and was very anxious to share, you know, I have Look, these sources, this video. This, you know, yeah, let's yeah. evaluate really where this story could go. I mean, yeah. Like, I think it was even like, not even like, look, we've got this video. It's like, look, this is a story. Like, this is where we're going with it. Like, like, can you start thinking about, like, is there some way, like, what should we have to go with it that's not just the words? Has that now, now that that's become the, the word for, you know, the great possibilities of, of multimedia journalism and what you do, has that set a bar so high that you're now like, oh my God, how do we do this next? I mean, for us, it's, it's what we want. I, I think, you know, we, there, are, there are stories where we work sort of independently from reporters and editors, like breaking news. We kind of have to all do as much as we can on parallel street, you know, sort of tracks as quickly as possible. But when it comes to continuing stories and enterprise pieces, to get together and think about the structure of stories, not the structure of the written article, separate from you know, how we're actually conceiving of multimedia, mm -hmm. but how are we going to make the use of all of the things that we can do to tell the story is pretty, it's not overwhelming, it's really pretty exciting. Who, who do you think of, finally, as, as your rivals? Who, who else is doing this well? Well, I think we have different kinds of rivals. You know, there are, there are sort of traditional news organization rivals, and you know, there are technology companies who are getting into different things that we do and doing it quite well. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a wide group of, uh, you know, sort of sources of competition. Yeah, like 15 or 20 years ago, like it would have been a very narrow sort of group of like, who, like who's doing this? It's like- The other, Economist has a lot of graphs. Right. right. No, but now it's like uh, things like Google puts up maps showing like what's happening in the crisis maps after a hurricane comes through. It's like, it's a much wider playing field than just sort of media organizations. And presumably that keeps you on your game. So. Very much. <laughs> Matthew and Steve, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you.